walk me through your process of journaling and how that affects you. Normally, journaling, what I would do is I would put myself in a position of a time to where I was traumatized the most. So before you open the book. Right. Okay. So I'll take myself back to that point. I open the book and I title who I am now mm -hmm. and try to give myself guidance from my past self mm -hmm. to let me know that I'm alive today, but what I can do to change my future going forward and what I need to do to maintain that type of positive attitude. Yeah. So, and then at the end of the journal, I would write the name of my old self in the past saying, you know, this is for me to you. Mm -hmm. I love you. Keep up the good work. Yeah. And that would keep me going. And that's just one. This is a journal. <laughs> did you learn that from anybody or did you? I came up with it myself. You know, it's powerful, right? journaling journaling and walks that journaling joint you told me was probably one of the most beautiful things i've ever heard bro for real. writing a letter to yourself i ain't never thought of nothing like that yeah it came into my mind the time when i changed my name how long ago how long you been doing that for journaling wise i've been long i probably started like april that's that was beautiful but the walks i just did like two weeks ago because you know i stayed near local the journaling is beautiful. I can get to the walk later. That journaling, like you said that, and I like I pictured the process. It like it felt like you were showing me a movie, or hey, there's a better way to do this. And I was like, what's key is when you're in that space and you figure out the emotion that you're feeling, because obviously it'll hit you you, know, it'll hit, hit you by surprise, right? Yeah. But it's different. There's gonna be different emotions. So if you're experiencing this emotion and it's intense, mm -hmm. and you see that you're in it. Yeah. Immediately think of a time when it affected you when it was very traumatic to you when you was a kid. Mm -hmm. So that was me during this time, Malcolm. Mm -hmm. Do zero. Love Malcolm. Mm -hmm. and that's it. Yeah, nah, that's that's torch. You oh, okay. said that. I was like, I was like, I know we were mid mid the chat. But I was like, you made me want to like go take a walk. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you had said that in the beginning, how important it is to find the source of it. Yeah. When you're in this hole, what's the source and the cause of it? Mm -hmm. It's very important. Because if you can find out where the source is, mm -hmm. you'll be ready the next time it happened to you. Yeah. But again, with me, it still happens where it hits me by surprise and I'm sinking down. But I know I'm perfect. You, you don't want your dad to do. You feel me? And nah, I just, just all proud of you. you already know I'm proud of you. But nah, I just know I'm proud of you. Damn. All right, guys. Welcome back to another episode of Mental Health Monday here. My boy Zero. Zero. How, how you doing? What's up? I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. All the cameras. I know all the cameras you like set up. Mm -hmm. Got a lot of bright lights. Oh, yeah. Art. Whole setup. I got to put more art up. Got some dark spots. Be fine. Got to come here with a swiffer, some broom, you know, clean up, hold on to stuff. But, um, Tell the people who it all, who you are and what it is that you're going through. Um, I'm zero. Mm -hmm. um, I've been dealing with a few mental issues ever since I was a kid growing up in foster care. Um, but lately, I've recently been dealing with a lot of anxiety and depression. So here today, to kind of speak on it. Want to educate those that are going through similar experiences that I'm going through. Get the proper advice proper suggestions and recommendations were not have a nice heart to heart are is anxiety and depression related to ideation is it related partially yeah okay how so uh it i honestly i guess it would depend on what would trigger each one <laughs> but if it was something, let's say, pertaining to work, it could trigger both of them simultaneously. Okay. And if that happens, you have to do your best to try to get yourself up out of that situation regarding to maybe some type of, let's say, positive activity to help build the faith. Mm -hmm. But normally, to me, they kind of go hand in hand. But some people, they could be separate. What do you think of 
Mental health, what's the first thing that comes to mind? First thing that comes to mind? Mm -hmm. Mental struggle. Okay. Depression. Um, anxiety. Okay. Uh, Wait, it's not deep. Feelings that you can't control. Okay. Negative feelings. Let's, let's start with control. What's it like to not be able to control a feeling or control how the feeling makes you feel? Well, you get, I guess I can say you get too deep in your thoughts mm -hmm. and it just sinks you down and it seems like you can't find any way or any escape. Mm -hmm. You need some type of guidance or advice to help you get out of wherever you are. Mm. When it comes to the average person who may either be trying to help out someone in your situation or someone that comes across what you've experienced, what do you think people get wrong in their assumption? Do they get wrong? I guess probably reading a person. Okay. They probably, they would think that this person may be frustrated or in anxious but maybe this person could be depressed maybe this person could be suicidal mm -hmm. maybe this person it just misread it mm -hmm. right and oh no that's a good question no no i got you do you think i think when it comes to like suicide depression and sadness those are three different categories of things and where we are where we are right now as a society and when it comes to marketing is very it's robust in the sense that it feels like a lot of things are getting thrown into the same pan you feel what i'm saying like uh i forgot the name of that chef but when he cooks he'd be like boom the one with the uh, flame hair that like owns a whole bunch of spots in like vegas at Ramsey. yeah and that's kind of what like mental health is now right so like a lot of folks are now conflating I'm sad with I'm depressed and a lot of folks are conflating I don't want to be here anymore like the exhaust of I don't want to be here anymore with suicide and it's like no nah, that's not you may just not want to be in that situation versus you wake up every day and every day you want to you know end it <laughs> and that's that's a very different concept I don't want to be here anymore you know how you watch a lot of anime we watch a lot of anime mm. well folks like that they're like well if you don't want to be here anymore you seem to be fighting really hard for your life you feel what i'm saying versus someone who is like oh no nah, they really don't want to be here anymore and it's like very obvious not just in the way they keep themselves like their house is a death trap and i can't help this person just off the fact that i might be in danger you know they're opening out so when it comes to um i don't even want to say the work that we do i think it's important to have conversations with folks that are on one extreme just to hear them out so people understand hey that bout that they're going through has it has a source you feel what i'm saying because like you've been through a lot from getting to know you but there's also like a lot of receipts of like, now nah, there's a lot of sources for why someone would feel that way in that person's situation when things keep going awry. So when you think about these feelings, these diagnoses and these experiences that you've had, have you ever thought, yo, is there a source to the thing? Or do you think knowing the source wouldn't really make a difference at this point? Because like, there's just so much that has to be handled by you on the daily. But knowing your source is actually really important. Okay. Because if you actually see what a source is that's causing the emotion, mm -hmm. if you had a proper help or the proper guidance or the proper willpower, you'd be able to dissect that source for the next time it actually happens mm -hmm. that you can put on the trigger so it doesn't go spiraling downhill again. Yeah. Because this is a pattern. Yeah. Every time the source starts and you go downhill, the source is always going to be the same. Yeah. Right. So if you decide to go downhill, you're not getting the help you need mm -hmm. or the guidance that you need. It's a spiral and it continues going on, running on and on. And that becomes habitable. When 
when would you say the thoughts started for you? Like the ideations of? Normally with me, it would start after something bad would happen. Well, no, not when it would start. Let me reframe that. When did this start for you? Oh, when did it start for me? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think that's something I never asked you before. When I was a little kid, yeah. When you was a kid? Yeah. That's why it's become habits right now because mm-hmm. I'm a grown man now. Yeah. And I've been accustomed to this. Mm-hmm. Right. So again, even if I know the source, it's part of who I am now. Yeah. Unless I get the proper help to change me. Yeah. Um Do you remember what age? Or if you had an idea? Eight or nine. Eight or nine? Then what was eight what was that like? Right. One of my first traumatic experiences. What was that not like? Not how you were raised but what was that like when you became aware that there may be dangerous thoughts that are influencing your actions how bad i felt Mm -hmm. at that time yeah and Mm -hmm. at that point i felt trapped and it felt like there was no way out why is this happening to me you know everyone asks that question but Mm he at that point that's where it started would you say looking back there were people who tried to be there for you or tried to help at least yes i think so but i believe the people that gave me this guidance or tried to give me this um these type of teachings well they misread me so that's what, so that's what i'm saying if you think someone's anxious and ain't really anxious you mm-hmm. misread them yeah right if someone says it was sad and you think they're angry you misread them so, so you be, be, would you be labeled with something and understanding that what they're saying is coming from a helpful place, but the words that they're using are actually wrong for the situation that you were in emotionally or at that time? Yeah. How would you say that led to your situation being mishandled when you would have these moments? Well, during this time, if you're getting help from a psychologist or a therapist, they're mm-hmm. talking to you based on their teachings most of them are not being taught to you based off their experience that's just me mm-hmm. so again yeah this is about your personal experience so that's like important yeah yeah because i do want your perspective on mm. what that has been like for you and i think that was one of my biggest issues growing up was since i was in these spots of depression and sadness and anxiety mm-hmm. um and these therapists or psychologists read me in the wrong way I was still willing to open up and show my emotion just because I was a kid and I felt like I needed the help and I was trapped. Mm-hmm. But the words that they were giving me and the teachers that they were giving me wasn't helping me. Yeah. Because again, it's based off of that resume. It's not based off of experience. Mm-hmm. Person that grew up in foster care, he grows up to be a psychologist or a therapist. He has experience. Mm-hmm. What he's talking about and what he's teaching you, he's coming from a place where he's trying to put himself in your shoes. Mm-hmm. And he can do that. Yeah. But there's other people that's like that, that's not like that, that are just teaching you things that they learn in the book, mm-hmm. thinking that they're reading you in the right way, thinking that they're helping you. Yeah. And in tune, it really hurt. Yeah. And then I'm at an age now to was, for instance, asking me, yo, you need to get help. You need to see a psychologist. I'm like, I don't want to talk to a therapist. Yeah. Why you don't want to talk to a therapist? Why? Man, we trying to help you. You ain't trying to help yourself. Bro. Yeah. I'm telling you this through experience. And I've been one of those friends. You feel what I'm saying? But you've told me like, hey, I've gone through seeking psychological treatment. And when you say that, I always wondered like, did he go one time? Did he go two times? Did he go 10,000 times? And I was saying as a kid here, right? As a kid growing up, I'm yeah, I'm opening up and trying to get that help. But every mm-hmm. time I'm going to someone, it's not the help I need. Yeah. So then I reached a certain age to where it's like, man, I don't even want to deal with that because it's not helping. What age would you say that was for you? Were you just like, nah, this is a, this is a lot of disappointment. So, you know, you know, around middle, out of middle teenage years, when you become a delinquent, mm-hmm. you're starting to develop those trust issues of who you want to trust and who you don't. Yeah. That's around that time. But do you think there were moments people could have helped you that you needed instead of what they were trying to give you? that would have been better for who you are now when it comes to the ideations, not just the depression and anxiety. I feel like ideation for you is a really important topic because 
I think there's few times that you get to just honestly speak on what you've been through, why it's no longer feasible for you to get help, and why even if you do get help, there's been such a buildup of trust issues from when you were younger. Now there's just this hard shell that's been crusted over that even if you do get help, there may be times getting help or receiving help feels wrong in that aspect mm -hmm. and that's not fair to the people that actually might have some experience and been in similar situations that i've been yeah that actually want to reach out and help me and i'm kind of like i got a ball up just mm -hmm. because of my past experiences yeah for an example movie antoine fisher mm -hmm. you know what i mean when he had an interview and he started working with his therapist his therapist was talking from a place of experience and yeah. of comfort and of understanding mm -hmm. because he already knows i know your source yeah let's start there Right. Most people are not like that. Yeah. What do you think of therapy? Not just your experience. What do you think of seeing people get therapy and get better, but knowing or having the understanding and the conviction that if I get it, it won't be the same for me result wise? Honestly, I think this mindset isn't good because it's negative. Mm -hmm. If if you're you're more positive about the situation and you be receptive mm -hmm. to what's being told to you, yeah, you can make a positive change. Mm -hmm. But again, dealing with all of this, you know, trust issues and depression, yeah, it's hard to open up to anyone. And also, that's not for you right now at this age. That's not the first layer. That'd be hard for you. It's getting the money to get a therapist that's just money I, right now i was talking to my guy he's a social worker and you know we're talking about he he's we've known each other for like a decade right he hit me up he's like hey you know i know this might be off because i'm a social worker but i need help i'm finally coming to you to get help in therapy and he was like, you know, I know we've spoken on this before and I hit you up and then I got cold feet and I left it alone, but I'm, I'm ready to get therapy. And for me, it's it's always um, sensational when a friend reaches out, but it's also to me a bit sad when you realize that this person was struggling to get what to I think they deserve. Right. Gave you know, resources, reached out to a couple of my folks, my personal network and his personal network to figure some things out. And now he's going to be able to get a therapist. But right now it's like per session, even with insurance as a social worker, which counts as being a caregiver to the community, it's like 125 per session. And he was like, bro, that is way too expensive. And for someone in his situation, I agree. But it's like, I know for the therapist, the therapists have to make a living and with the price of everything going up, unfortunately, the price of the services are going up to balance that out. But for him, he needs help. How do we find him something that's affordable and he have a right fit with the therapist that he's reaching out to? Because in his case, he didn't let me know what's going on. He just let me know he needs help. And as a friend, I was like, you know, I told him anytime people reach out to me, I treat them as a friend first and a client who needs a resource second. So even after you get a therapist, I'm very keen on, if possible, trying to follow up with you to see like, hey, is this therapist a right fit? Because I don't want you to to waste money because like, for, you know, getting therapy is a dating game. <laughs> when you date, you got to have a budget to go on a certain amount of dates to feel, hey, True. do I really mess with this person or not? <laughs> and now that he's here, it's very much like, it's disappointing that for him, he doesn't even really get to start the process in full because it's like, yo, with inflation, with groceries for 21 items in any grocery store it used to be like 128 and now it's like $432 just to eat. You don't really have an excess of money like we used to, to have to decide to go have fun, to go like go get therapy and maybe right go take yourself out on a day and really sit with your feelings. And now it's like picking and choosing. We're at the point right now as an economy that we're picking and choosing livelihood over help. Uh. 
So with things like that, it's very hard for me to pick up the phone for somebody like you and be like, oh, you got therapy? Yeah, you you know, I've never done that to you. <laughs> no, <that's good. laughs> Which would be crazy. But like, I've also have an understanding of just how broad your experience has been as like a child, teenager, young adult, an adult now. So for somebody like you, when it comes to coping or balancing out what what are the few things that you're able to do for yourself not to find peace but to find some resemblance of a little bit less chaotic in the fall factors well to me i think it goes two ways Mm -hmm. like if you feel like you're in you're trapped and you're in a dark hole you're in a space yeah just seeking help i feel isn't enough you gotta have some type of willpower to get up on your own. Mm-hmm. So whether you're getting the outside help is one thing. Yeah. But self-help is also critical. Mm-hmm. So every morning I would try to have maybe three or four notes around my crib, mm-hmm. positive affirmations. Mm-hmm. Repeat them out loud to myself, build that faith and that confidence. So affirmations. Our affirmations. Yeah, yeah, no, I got you. I know um, you be going between <laughs> new languages here, yeah. is, so no, I got you. So going over those and repeating those a couple times a day mm-hmm. kind of try to keep me in a clear space to where though I'm not sinking down to the bottom by the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Now that's my self-help, yeah. right? Yeah. Then go outside to try to get that other self-help to put both two together because That's like you said not picture. everybody has the money to be able to pay a therapist the so sunlight you affect to... your uh, mood hmm? the sunlight affect your, your mood sunlight does yeah okay okay my bad you could go back i just yeah, yeah, that was yeah. the outside part yeah yeah so you know dealing with that uh, that's also a good thing you brought up too morning mm-hmm. walks i just started that yeah. Very therapeutic. Yeah. Very therapeutic. Go for a walk for like 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. Stretch. Those things are very good um, that you can do and practice. But again, self-help is also key, which is something that I've been uh, keen to watching some videos online, mm-hmm. self-help books about the mind. And if you're speaking these positive things, they would trigger yeah. and it would affect your behavior. Yeah. So self-help is just as critical as you going out to get help. Mm-hmm. So you don't need to fully rely on that if you feel like you don't trust it. And that's a situation that I'm in. Okay. How important are the people who you call friends and family and even some associates as someone that struggles with ideations on a lot of ideations I think friends play a, a key part mm-hmm. but the friends understand your self-worth, right? Mm-hmm. But if you have a really close friend and they know you pretty well, do you understand to give you your space and give you the right keywords and the right motivation to help you? It might not be the best, mm-hmm. but in that situation, at least like, yo, this guy hit me up. He care about me. He, he told me, he hit me up thinking about me when I didn't even think he was. Oh, that's great. That helps yeah. my mood. Yeah. Right. That reinforces. Well, right. Most of the time, if I'm in a situation, I'm in a bad space mm-hmm. and I just don't have the the confidence or the motivation to lift myself up thinking that I'm worth I'm worthless in this world. I don't mean nothing to nobody because no one's communicating or he's sending me a text like, yo, how you doing today? Mm-hmm. Yo, how, how have you been doing? Well, what you been into? How's work? Yeah. How's any other hobbies that you're doing that puts a smile on your face? What's up? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If you're going through days where you have no friends that are like checking up on you at least once or twice every few days, that just sinks you down. Mm-hmm. So I think friends are critical, but friends need to come from an area of understanding, mm-hmm. but space as well. All, All right. right. So define understanding versus space, because now that goes into the balance and act that a lot of people aren't good at. Understanding is the fact that they would know what excites you Mm -hmm. and what would keep you up Mm -hmm. as far as you know continuing conversation continue to develop and improve yourself and space is just like yo he's in the space by himself he needs to eat you have this time to figure this out you don't want to suffocate him because if you do that Mm -hmm. put up a wall again yeah just like we're starting out as a teen dealing with uh, therapy and psychologists Mm -hmm. sometimes people just need that space to vent out on their own 
But that doesn't mean you completely reject them or ignore them. You still yeah. check up on them. Yeah. Or you give them a little bit of breathing room so they can kind of think and dissect. Because there's a lot of people that will just be quiet and don't say nothing for days. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those people. Yeah. But at least if I get a call or text message, person hit me up saying that I'm good, how I'm doing, mm -hmm. that helps a lot. Small things can go a long way. But do you think people have an issue with readjusting to who you are, your situation after you've opened up to them? Yes. There's been a lot of times where I've said many personal things to some friends, friends that I'm not, I don't know for a long time, mm -hmm. but friends that I felt a bond that we connect and we have good chemistry, those positive vibrations. Yeah. That if I say something about my past or something that I've been through, I would figure that it would bring them closer, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes it pushes them away. Yeah. Like, yo, so just gotta keep really going through that. I don't want to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And that's why you got to be selective. When you catch on to that, but what does that do to you as someone that already has so much on their plate? I mean, I, I kind of feel like I go back to the attitude as well as everyone's up, everyone's against me. Mm -hmm. They're not for me. They're against me. Yeah. You would feel like these people will come to an understanding because what I'm going through ain't my fault. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. If a lot of people will point to blame like, yo, you're in a situation, you're in this mental state because of you. Mm -hmm. The source of your anger and your sadness is on you. This is not a good understanding. Honestly, this is a misassessment or a diagnosis, if you will. I'd say that's like a 50-50 thing. They're not wrong, but they're not right. And this isn't from a defensive position, right? So observation, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. I've seen you dig yourself into a hole before emotionally with things leading up there. But I also know the part of you that digs itself out. Now, you know, for me, if I have too much on my plate, I'm not going to grab another man's plate and be like, oh, I got you. It's like, hey, I'm put this down. We come back to this. But for you, it's like, hey, man, that might be my life tomorrow if you put the plate down. And it's like, yeah, but as a friend, if I'm I'm very much like, hey, if I say I have your back or I'd like to look out for you, it's a two way street. Right. So when I look out for someone and I think a lot of people need this clarity when it comes to helping people or caring for people, it's very important to understand when something is outside of your wheelhouse or if you notice that a friend or a loved one is practicing the destructive behavior or the destructive self-talk, they need to go down that road until they realize, hey, there's nothing here for me until they want to come back up to the surface. Right. So most folks are like, well, that's risky because what if they end it and everything else? And it's like, that is true. But life, just like therapy, is a choice. Right. So I, as much as you've told me all these things that you've confided in me in, and we've had real discussions about this. I've also seen examples of you really want to live. Right. And that's why I say mm -hmm. having those friends that have a proper understanding, yeah. show that they care for you, providing that affection. Mm -hmm. When you have friends that are in your tight circle that are reminding you how important you are in this world and in yeah. society, yeah, that lets you know and gives you that spark. Like, I really don't want to end it. I want to end it. I really don't want to end it. I have friends that are showing me that mm -hmm. I'm worth something. Yeah. I'm and special. But you you've always you all you have always been worth something before we came into the picture as your friends. Sometimes I don't think about that when I'm trying. And and I get that. You feel what I'm saying? But you know, like a bee, let them out of the cage eventually. Cause you can't have too many bees in the trap. It's like the reference it's hip hop reference rap. I would <laughs> but like I will say though that I'm proud of who you allow yourself to become when you overcome your pain even if it's for a moment because like unfortunately you know trauma is a seed that slowly grows and it's a hell of a tree once it grows but Pain is something that you can kind of nip at and break down as you go and you can reconstruct it into what you feel is more necessary and applicable to who you are, what's going on. 
So when it comes to a lot of your journey and the pain that you've had to handle and the reality that I've seen you cope with, what part do you think pain and anguish plays in your journey as someone that struggles with SI? SI is code for suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. My man from the Matic episode told me about that. Very educational. Yeah. Normally, put yourself in a situation where you can try to flip that negative energy into a positive energy. Mm -hmm. One way would be a journal. Another way would be writing rhymes. Mm -hmm. Instead of just being down in that deep hole. Mm -hmm. Because if you can find a way to turn that energy around, yeah, that will help a lot. Right. And mm -hmm. obviously a lot of people do that. You know, people that are songwriters, they write songs because to them it's very therapeutic. Yeah. They need to write something down. They need to record something. It helps them feel good about themselves that they're able to release that out through that outlet. If you don't have a proper outlet, mm -hmm. then you just keep everything bottled up inside. Yeah. Destruction can happen. Yeah. Right. And my situation is very different because I deal with many, many mental issue, uh, health issues that affects me almost on a daily. Wow. So I have to come up with triggers to try to maintain that. Right. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind, which ones are you comfortable about talking about? Um, I have nightmares frequently. <laughs> um, bad visions of my past, being beaten as a kid. Obviously, I have, I'm nocturnal epileptic. Um, so just a few of those, you know, and that's it affects my well-being and my behavior to a degree mm -hmm. so again i gotta have some type of key triggers that will help me stay above water yeah because those things affect me on a daily like probably have nightmares maybe three or four times a week i don't sleep a lot i sleep but i don't sleep a lot but that's been like that for years mm -hmm. so again this is all habit yeah right it's not like habitual habitual yeah it's not like these things are happening maybe once or twice a month now, these things have been happening for a while. Then you can throw in what? Bi bipolar. Mm -hmm. All these things are engraved in me. Mm -hmm. So I have to try to find some way to maintain it before things can get destructive. Would you say there's moments that you can bring these things relief? Not as a choice, just like what you found outside of like, so you have medication. I don't know if you're on medication for any of that stuff right now, right? But outside of medication, would you say journaling and these other practices that you've been doing have helped any of these things? Yes. Walk me through your process of journaling and how that affects you. Normally journaling, what I would do is I will put myself in a position of a time to where I was traumatized the most. Mm -hmm. So before you open the book. Right. Okay. So I'll take myself back to that point. I open the book and I title who I am now mm -hmm. and try to give myself guidance from my past self mm -hmm. to let me know that I'm alive today, but what I can do to change my future going forward and what I need to do to maintain that type of positive attitude. Yeah. So... And then at the end of the journal, I would write the name of my old self in the past saying, you know, this is for me to you. Mm -hmm. I love you. Keep up the good work. Yeah. And that would keep me going. And that's just one. This is a journal. Did you learn that from anybody or did you? I came up with it myself. You know, it's powerful, right? I was going to say, you won't you get your credit. <laughs> How many, um, how many times a week would you say you journal? Uh, right now, I'm doing about like three or four times a week. Do you journal in the morning, in the sunshine, in the dark, at the crib? Do you journal the most when you feel things are going bad or when you feel you're at a good plane to have clear thoughts? Normally, I try to pinpoint it at a time during the day while I'm experiencing those neg negative emotions. Yeah. Because at that point, I can dissect exactly what the source is. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, I'm experiencing this. Let me go ahead and write this down. Yeah. Before this goes away, let me write this down. Yeah. Because then, as I'm looking back through my pages in my journal, and I'm seeing something that happened maybe two or three weeks ago that I'm experiencing now, I might know how to handle it better. Mm -hmm. Right? Because now I have the notes. 
Yeah. Now, if I go through that during the day and I don't write nothing down and I'm just remembering that it happened again, they'll continue to happen. I'm trying to find a way to break the cycle. Mm -hmm. If you break the cycle, you're providing yourself good self-help. Would you say the structure that you've built for yourself has been helpful in your mental health journey? And the reason I ask that question is <clears throat> mental health, which a lot of people don't realize is simply a measurement of health. You either have good health or you have bad health. But now when the word mental health is used, it has a very negative connotation of if you're bringing up mental health, it has to be something bad instead of working on how do we maintain the good. I asked you a question at the beginning, but I forgot what it was because I was like, I feel like that next bar was kind of like a strong bar right there. Mental health coming from a a negative aspect, mm -hmm. I guess it would depend on the person. But again, I went back to the beginning saying to me, mental health feels like it's in a space or an emotion of emotions that you can't control. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's kind of negative because if you can't eat, control your emotions, especially negative emotions, mm -hmm. you're just going to go down here. I think we can control our emotions to a certain point. Can we <laughs> control mental health? Well, it's a spectrum of things. So mental health is happy. Mental health is sad. Mental health is anger. Mental health is sometimes disappointment. So it's really feeling out what part of that lake are you currently floating in? And then either figuring out why am I in this part of this lake? Or would it be better for me to move to another part of the lake and look back at that other part and ask myself, how did I get there? Which I know for somebody like you, you may not even realize you're there. You just, you in the middle of it, you're like, oh, 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 oh how do we get here so quick? True. Yeah. Like when things like that happens, how does that play out for you? Or how do you get grounded? I, I'll be honest. Normally when it comes up to me like that, mm -hmm. I kind of just stop what I'm doing and just kind of soak. Mm -hmm. Like I'll be in a good headspace and something like that happens. Yeah. And I notice that I'm in it it would affect the next thing that I'm going to do for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm having a good day and I'm planning out things that I want to do and I, yeah. and I see and I feel that I'm in this space, mm -hmm. all the good things I want to do, I don't want to do them no more. And it's not a choice. I think a lot of people make a mistake of thinking you getting to that point, you made a choice to get to that point. And it's like, nah, it's literally sometimes in certain cases, I wake up and I'm just at that point. Maybe it was one of the nightmares Maybe I had a memory of something from back in the day, but I opened my eyes and I wanted to end. I just want the screen to go black for a very long time. And I can't really help myself when that happens. As sometimes outside of a book, I need uh, the voice of a friend. Yeah. And I think, I think what makes getting therapy for somebody like you much harder, because I'm I've dealt with people like you. I hate to say it like that, but I have. I have friends who have struggled with ideations, not a lot of ideations, who get help. But those friends have actually called on me back in the day when they needed to get like a new, they just needed someone to talk to in the middle of, yo, it's getting real bad out here. It's getting spooky. I never knew my friend had a therapist. <laughs> my friend was like, I got a therapist. We get an emergency meeting tomorrow. But like, I just needed 20, 25 minutes of call, talking to someone who wasn't my therapist, who was a friend in the middle of, in the middle of my emergency. And I know you care about my emergency as much as you care about me. And in that space, it's, yes. it's always good to actually have a friend to check up on you or a friend that you can actually go to. Mm -hmm. Because there'll be some times where I admit, where I've randomly been in those situations to where as though, dang, I'm here, I'm mm -hmm. about to soak, I don't wanna do nothing else. Yeah. Normally what you wanna do is, if you're experiencing and you're in those spaces, do the most immediate thing that's positive. Let's say I'm in my crib, I'm feeling down, mm -hmm. I'm on the PlayStation, Yeah. anime, yeah. Mango, listen to some music. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes I don't even want to do that. Mm -hmm. But if I have enough energy to call my friend up, yo, I'm going through this. Can we talk for a few minutes? Yeah. That would change everything. Yeah. 
right? So even if I don't want to even engage in those positive activities that can boost me up, boost my self-esteem, boost my attitude, mm-hmm. if I'm not even relying on those, at least I can rely on a friend. Yeah. Now, if I don't rely on a friend and decide to take the action to do those things to try to get me up out of my situation, mm-hmm. then I think it's a choice. Yeah. Because at that point, I'm just like, I give up. I don't want to do nothing for the rest of the day. I might just sit in bed. Mm-hmm. But you're not getting out. Yeah, but it's better to give up on the rest of your day than to give up on yourself. That is, though. What, giving up on the rest of your day? Yeah. You think so? Or you're going to be in you. No, so. I mean, you're going to be in the mood for the rest of the day. You decide to be in that mood for the rest of the day until the night, and then you go to sleep. And Mm -hmm. then the next morning, you woke up cranky. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You ended the day on a bad note. Have you ever seen an ideation roll over into a whole month? Yeah. Damn. I, I felt like you just had like a flashback when I said that. Yeah. Yeah. What's what's. Is there a loss of time when that happens? Like describe to me what that experience is like. Oh, man, it's tough. Like cut off all electronics, cut off your phone. You don't do nothing for a while. Mm-hmm. And then when you decide to go out, let's say you want to go to the grocery store. It seemed like a whole new world. Mm. You're talking to people in the grocery store, just, you're having problems with dialect convo because you've been isolated for so long. You haven't want to talk to nobody. It changes everything. Yeah. Your demeanor, your attitude, your posture, everything changes. <clears throat> Would you say your experience of going between countries has also affected your mental health? <laughs> To a degree, yeah. How so? Now this is where you got to tell us where you've been. <laughs> um, I think, well, it wouldn't be necessarily negative mental health. Yeah. Because obviously, like, when I would travel and I lived in Asia, mm-hmm. the biggest thing was culture shock. Like, what Col- part? Japan, China. We start with China mm-hmm. and Beijing. So culture shock is one thing, right? And then... The next thing would be a little bit of frustration because you're like, how can I communicate with these people? How can I order food? How can I be like, yo, I need directions to go here and no one understands it. You get frustrated. Mm -hmm. You're in a country where no one looks like you. So you kind of feel shelled up. But at the same time, you know you're not going to be here forever. And you also know that this is a life changing experience. You want to take the best, you know, use the best option and courses you have. So you're balancing frustration with excitement. Right. Mm -hmm. Because to me, it's a learning experience. This is a journey. Yeah. Right. You can use that as motivation. Right. You know what? Every day I'm going to do my best to speak a little bit Chinese. Every day I'm going to get better. Let me make some friends. We speak Chinese. We speak English. Let me make some friends. We go out. We drink. That affects your mood. Yeah. And that helps you up. So. Shout out to your brother. He talk a lot. But he's a good person. I told him that this fits. Boys at the birthday drive last time. Ah, uh, yeah. got the smoothies and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um... How hard was the reimmersion back into American culture when you came back? Um, also culture shock. I tell a lot of people this and they look at me like, yo, you was born here, why? It's not that simple. Right, I was in Asia for nine years. I came back here, everything changed. And governments change, laws change. How people handle their politics and speak on the politics change. How people talk. Yeah. Right. You yeah. know, slang and different terms that I never heard of. Yeah. You know, how people present news, misinformation. I came back when I came back to the States. I'm like, what are you talking about misinformation? Yeah. I thought Internet was reliable. <laughs> no, no, no. Everything is fact checked yeah. now. I'm like, yeah. what is that? Yeah. So, yeah. Culture shock. So the biggest thing to me was, you know, dealing with that, how much America has changed. And also medication, because like I said, I was on medication a lot. Mm-hmm. I still am. But when you're on medication a lot out there compared to when you came back here. Yes. Would you say who had the better medication or the better effect? Uh, in Asia. It's better. Damn. And it was much cheaper. Yeah. I've heard about that. <laughs> 
Talk yeah. about that. Talk about uh, um, the market. I think that's like a very important discussion. Yeah, that, that was really good. Um, yeah. Especially healthcare. Mm-hmm. Um, better in Japan than it was in China, but. How so? What's $40 like? a month. What's the comparison of China to Japan? Like money, experience, um, uh, concerns. Diagnosis. It's a brand new chair, by the way, so you know, enjoy that, man. Fresh cushion. Uh, diagnosis was easy. You don't really need to go to an actual um, doctor to get a prescription. You know what I mean? You just go up to, let's say, um, over the counter. Um, you have a translator if you can't speak the language. You mm-hmm. tell them, you list a couple of your symptoms. They know immediately what you need. Yeah. They get it to you. Normally, they give you the, um, how do I say, the weakest dosage mm-hmm. to test how it would affect your body. And if yeah. you need something stronger, you come back. Mm-hmm. So normally, that's how it is. Um, shots is easy. Um, if you're sick and you know, here we got called 911 ambulance come, there's a whole process to that. Mm-hmm. It's swift there. Yeah. Like it's swift to me. And then literally probably like every other block, there's a clinic. Mm-hmm. So there's always someone on hand to help you if you need assistance. And so they like have that. strong infrastructure. Right. And yeah. So it's, it's, it's easier there. Much, much easier. Like, yeah. And they don't, this is good and bad, but there's a very small list of drugs that's illegal mm-hmm. right mostly the drugs that we have in america is legal mm-hmm. but other places it's not like that yeah. and they don't look at it in a bad sense you know what i mean like oh yeah this guy's coming here because he's trying to practice substance abuse it's nothing like that how it is in mm-hmm. america we automatically had this mindset of this is what people are going to do if we give them these drugs they're going to abuse it for this yeah Overseas, it's not like that. Yeah. If you need this and you honestly are in this space and you're experiencing these symptoms, mm-hmm. we can help you. Here, this is for you. And you take it and you're responsible about it. If you need more, you come back. Did you ever look into therapy when you were over there or thought about it? I thought about it. I thought about it. But the situation was the time mm-hmm. and also the situation with effort of trying to speak the language. Mm-hmm. Because it's already, you know, me being American, me speaking English. Being in America, it's already hard for me to be able to open up to someone and, you know, go into detail about what I'm going through. Mm-hmm. Imagine me trying to do that with a Chinese doctor. Yeah. A Japanese doctor. Leading a translator. Right. So now instead of it being one person now, it's two people. There's one person translating what you have going on to the doctor from another culture who may not understand you but would like to help you right and they have good experience they have a good clear understanding of one and understanding where you're coming from mm-hmm. and they have keyword patience yeah they have yeah. it do you think there's a lack of patience on this side yes yeah. a lot um a lot. Yeah. what are your thoughts on therapy not you not getting therapy but your thoughts on therapy like what you've seen either people receive or what it does for others i don't want to knock no therapist mm-hmm. uh, i think it's a great profession mm-hmm. um but i believe that the most qualified therapists that can get proper assessments proper diagnosis are people that have had that experience mm-hmm. that experience that they dealt with as a, a adolescent as a young adult um was key in motivating them in becoming a therapist Mm -hmm. like yo i'm done with this i've dealt with x y and z you know what i'm gonna become a social worker i'm become a therapist to help other kids that experience similar situations to to me yeah right so those therapists i really respect now the other therapists that you know may not have had that much experience dealing with that firsthand Mm -hmm. but they just have some type of passion that they wanted to study that as a degree I don't find them as qualified to provide the proper help. You can feel when someone's working with an assumption versus an, ex- an experience. Right. Mind people if I that. share a story with you? Sure. You know, but but you as well say people that, that sound like a bar, which you have the rubber hands, people that. People that rely on the resume mm-hmm. and the paycheck over the people that rely on the outcome of helping their patients. But yeah. two different things. Yeah. Which one would you go with? Yeah. Which one is more reliable? Which one is going to help you out of your situation? Mm-hmm. That's where the trust come in at. Yeah. And I mean, for you, you come in to therapy with your bias, as you should, because of what you experience. But your intuition is usually pretty spot on when it comes to that. Like you understand, hey, am I dealing with some real niggas here? So 
I was on the phone with my sister two nights ago. You know, I'm a night owl. Do a lot of my work edits, everything else, middle of the night. Her and I, we haven't talked in like three months. So she sent me a text because we wanted the social media siblings send all, each other a lot of links. Hey, this funny. Hey, this funny. No combos, just straight link, 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 link. Two, three months. That's like the form of communication. And she sent me the text. It was like, I think it was like, 2 10 in the morning mm. and i happened to be up and i was like i got five minutes i could call her three hour conversation mm. got deep yeah 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 got deep found out about a whole bunch of stuff i ain't hear from her in a brick and she was telling me about her therapist and blase blah we got to the part of her and her therapist broke up right and they broke up because she also has a chronic illness, right? Doctors trying to figure out and everything else. And I remember the therapist kept saying that she needed to do something that she told the therapist she's not willing to do. And that's not the solution. But the therapist was using her situation to try and take care of her own situation. So the therapist was trying to live vicariously through my sister, giving her advice on this and that, a relationship she needs to take care of. And my sister has explained to her before, well, I told you I don't want to do that because this, that, the third, that person is not going to be open to it. I'm not going to put myself in a position to talk or communicate with someone who already has shown a behavior of they're not listening and I'm not going to be heard. And why would you put me in that position as my therapist? So therapist catches an attitude, all this other stuff. Then the therapist is like, well, you don't seem like someone who has a plan. So what's next? My sister was like, fam, I'm chronically ill. Like right now I can't work. I'm trying to figure things out. I'm going to therapy to actually try to figure things out right now. And that's what we're here to do. And the therapist went back to, well, if you're not going to do this for this situation, I don't know how I could help you. And it's like, fam, those are very separate things. As a therapist, it's not one solution that fits all. True. You're supposed to listen to your client and catch on on other things. Mm. And even if you catch on on something, your suggestion may not be that suggestion if that person isn't ready for it especially if they can tell you how and why they're not ready for it and give you the valid reasons. And those reasons are valid, whether you think that way or not. Mm. So I find it disappointing when you as a therapist aren't able to transition to how else can I better help my client? And it becomes, well, you didn't listen to what I told you to do. No, that's not, that's not your job. It's not, your, it's not a therapist's job to tell you what to do. It's their job to put up a mirror to you. And as a mirror, show you other perspectives of yourself. Right. And if a person decides to deal with that, cool. If a person decides not to deal with that, that's also cool. Because you're only going to work as hard as you want to. You're not going to work as hard as other people tell you to, especially when it comes to your own situation. <clears throat> So when there's people like you who don't get therapy, I disagree, but I understand. You get what I'm saying? My platform is built on getting people help, but your help is only going to help as much as you're willing to do work or be in a position to do work. So, so I also understand that I'm not just your friend, but I'm also your confidant. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's better. Yeah, sometimes that it's better to have friends that actually have an understanding that can really help you more than a therapist could. Like that situation, yeah. there's many red flags. Number one, a uh -huh. therapist would never say, I don't know what I can do to help you. A therapist would never say that. Well, a therapist would never want to exceed the boundaries I tell them to do something or force them to do something. Therapy, or therapist automatically sets boundaries from the first session. I, I think there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know what to do 
for you. I don't know what else to do for you. I don't never No, 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 no. There's nothing wrong with that because it lets me as a client know, well, you're not the person I need to be talking to. I need to find somebody else. That's why I don't have an issue with that because I'd rather someone tell me, hey, you don't know what to do with me. After we've worked all the options out because you have an attitude, I think that's the issue. The issue is her attitude towards my sister because whether it's my sister or not, the service is the service, but it's the attitude of, well, I don't know what to do for you. And it's like, fam, my sister is not here for you to live out the life you no longer can go to patients because understand. their dad's passed away. That has nothing to do with my sister, even if you shared the, yourself with my sister in that way. You get what I'm saying? She's made her choice. She's made her decision. And that client's decision is going to be the right decision because that's their life. Now, after that said and done, and my sister has dealt with your BS, my sister is still willing to ask and hear what else you're willing to suggest. And because you're upset, your client isn't willing to entertain this one little thing. Now, all other help is out the window. And that's where the therapist was wrong. You feel what I'm saying? I'd rather have somebody tell me, hey, that's outside of my wheelhouse. So I could go somewhere else and just be like, hey, you know, I appreciate it. We made the progress that we made versus you're catching an attitude because there's one thing the client's not. The client is the one who has the choice on what they would like to do or not like to do for it because it's their life and their life is the one that's going to be handled. And you're supposed to respect those boundaries. You get a week, right? You get you get to talk to me for one hour out of two weeks. And then I'm left with all these other hours to deal with the actual reality that is my life. So, and I think, was that therapy so responsible? Hell yeah, but my sister caught on to it. But a lot of people, when well, you're the client, um, and this is, this isn't really, I, I don't have an issue with folks saying, hey man, just go burn the bridge. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Hey, just go burn the bridge. You're going to be like, hey, what the matches, man? Go play with fire on the bridge. Because it's like, your therapist has a good understanding of who you are and who you're not, right? They understand what you've been through. Hopefully, if they've done enough digging and painted, painted enough pictures with you, they understand what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do. Even if the therapist's advice was correct, my sister's handling of the conversation was a little bit better than the therapist, not because she's the client, but because she knows her life and she understands. Exactly. Hey, that obstacle you want me to touch, that's not an obstacle that's for me. If I want closure, I don't need to go to the person to have these conversations that you're suggesting. Because for me, that's not my issue. And that's also not the cause of a lot of anguish that's going on in my life right now. Now, this therapist came off of Medicaid and my sister told me, unfortunately, there's a lot of therapists who aren't the, that are found on Medicaid. So you really have to like go with a fine comb to find the right therapist. But at least she's not paying for it. So the financial fence that we talked about of 125 per session, it's not really an issue. But disappointment is a price that's paid after you realize, dang, we did all this work just for it to end like that. And now I got to go back into the dating game of what therapist do I want? Yeah. And I told her, I said, hey, you need to report that therapist. And the reason I told her to report that therapist, whether I do, I have this platform that works with therapists or not, people need to be held accountable. There's a certain amount of recklessness that you shouldn't move with as a therapist. If you're here to help, help. If you're not here to help, don't help. Why are you arguing with your client, bro? That's what I'm saying. Your client came to you with problems. And all you did on the way out was fatten her bag with another problem, which is now you. The handling of the situation. And she's told me on numerous occasions that she's called the therapist not listening to her. And, and I think I think about stuff like that. You feel what I'm saying? I'm very realistic when it comes to the, hey, if people get help, I tell folks, hey, you should have a list of things that you look out for when you sit down with a therapist. Is this person listening? If you've brought up something, do they have a memory of the situation? Or at least you can tell there's lights going on in the back of their head of you did mention that before. We made that mistake. Let's not do that again. Is this person really concerned? 
when it comes to you? Or are they trying to be the other side of the coin, which you've also heard me talk about? Are they just trying to get you to like, I will just go do this, that, that should work, that work from all their clients. And it's like, fam, it's not, no situation is cookie cutter. Like you can grow up in the same house with someone, be raised by the same parents, go to the same school, eat the same food, like the same shows. I was going to say, fuck the same hoes, but nah, <laughs> right? But your situations are still going to be different. So when I see and hear things like that, I tell folks like, nah, stand up for yourself. Always stand up for yourself. Whether you're getting therapy or not, it's very important that you stand 10 toes down for the service that you deserve. And I know that's very hard to say to someone who may not know their self-value and that's what they're in therapy for, or may not know they treat therapists as doctors and it's like this person is treating you but the people who treat you also may need to be guided in what treating you well looks like within a session right number two request a therapist who deals with people that has chronic illnesses unfortunately us as able people able-bodied people we have this assumption that help is help and as you said before the source where that help comes from matters if you have a therapist that deals with folks who have chronic illnesses or has a chronic illness themselves, they'll be more understanding of your situation as someone who has a chronic illness and what that looks like. My partner has educated me on that. Sure. She's had some good therapists, but she's told me herself, hey, there's just a complete different quality of care and understanding that comes from a therapist that comes from a background and understand what it means to deal with someone with a chronic illness and how they talk to you and how they treat you and how they approach a situation that you tell them about that understanding as you said goes a far way does you know coming from the background of foster care coming from the background of dealing with folks that have gone through that and being more empathetic towards the person's situation and the decisions that they've had to make coming out of that system like you as a person that's been in that you can feel when someone really understands what you're going through and why you made that decision instead of gasping. You're not a movie when you talk to them. Sometimes you'll sit down and they're still like, that really happened? You really went through that? You're like, bro, that was, yeah. <laughs> you, are you eating popcorn in the middle of our session right now? Cause I'm not a movie, bro. And like, <clears throat> For people like you, I get what you mean when you say it can't just be what have you learned in school. As much as a lot of folks are becoming therapists, a lot more people are moving into the mental health scene and the mental health area. There is this misconception that all help is help. And it's like, it's nice that there's people who want to help. But once you get into help and once you get into getting therapy and once you get into helping others, the person you're helping does recognize what kind of genuine interactions or experiences you may have had that add to the job. And that's not something that you find on a resume. That's why you say resume and check so much because you're like, look, either you've been willing to be in those environments. And if not, you need to be realistic on you may not understand everything this person is actually going through as much as you want to convince yourself that you understand everything this person's gone through there's a better understanding. There's a, you know, a better level of temperament, mm -hmm. patience, yeah. right? It's, it's key. It's really key. Would and now audio reflection is reliable. Would you say what I said is spot on? Yes, definitely. Definitely. And that therapist definitely unprofessional. Mm. Really. Why? Not even a question. <laughs> Would you, and I say this as someone who knows your answer, what do you think are the three things that are currently in the way of you getting therapy? Mm -hmm. And and it doesn't just have to be finances. It could be yeah. it could be hey my past. You feel what I'm saying? I've gone through so so much. But you you say you're three. I don't want to step on your point. I was thinking trust is definitely number one. Mm -hmm. Um, a tie. Mm -hmm. Because let's say I agree to see a therapist for three months. Just because I agree to see a therapist for three months don't mean in those three months I'm going to go ahead and tell everything that's happened to me. Yeah, It's going to take longer than that. 
Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So that plays too. It takes it takes nine nine months to a couple of years for people to really open up. It, it takes a while. It's it's not something that can be done overnight. And when you when you take in that nine months to a couple of years, start looking at that bank account getting drained, feeling as a client, I may not be making progress, but I I don't think it's fair to say progress is up to you as someone that's really trying to work through that hard shell that's crusted over from when you were a kid. Well, from my some of my past experiences, uh-huh. from some of my friends' past experiences that also grew up in foster care, mm-hmm. some of the therapists that they've dealt with, yeah, and I'm talking about therapists that actually come from a similar background than we that we've had come from. Mm-hmm. The first couple of sessions, they'll kind of go up and open up to you and let them know, like, yo, I know what you've been through. Let me go ahead and explain to you. We have some similarities. I'll let you know, yo, I was in a shelter. I was in a mm-hmm. group home for such and such. I can come from, I come from a similar place than you've come from. Yeah. They'll let you know that within the first couple of sessions. Cause you, you can kind of relax and be like, all right, I can trust you. You kind of understand where I'm coming from. Mm-hmm. And then the vibe changes. Yeah. Now other therapists that are licensed therapists, you know, in different states and just have a degree and not have that experience. They won't do that. Yeah. Right. The therapists that actually come from a similar place or let you know to make you feel more comfortable. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. Yeah. So I've experienced that sometimes too. Have you ever thought about going to get therapy and letting them know, hey, I, I want to work with a therapist that has either handled folks that have come out of the foster care system or they themselves have come out of the foster care system? Do you think that make a difference in the shopping experience? It would make a difference. It would. It would. We we haven't had this talk in a while, so like I feel like no, I'm, it would. I feel like I'm I'm making a breakthrough on something that we've discussed before. But also, this talk has also given me like a better understanding. Like, you know, I'm believing you. That's not the question. I'm always a matter of like, I when and what's the what what does my my boy need? I was about to say the N word. What, what but, does my boy need? No, but honestly, yeah. when I first met you and then I watched some of your content and how mm-hmm. passionate you are about mental health, why am I still thinking in the back of my mind that I need a therapist? You providing me more into and more information than a, a qualified therapist is. You doing more I mean, things. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You're showing a passion. You're showing an understanding. I would rather trust you. I do instead of taking that risk. I do understand my impact, but sometimes the better help is not when you're not looking for it. No, no, I get that. I get that. But like, I don't have the right solutions. They do. You just said not all therapists have all the answers. None of them do. No, I didn't say none of them. You just changed my sentence. I said not all. Which not all. There are some who do have the answers. I don't believe that. No, they are. The, who do you think I got my information from? I work with 10 therapists. I've learned everything from the 10 therapists that I work with. So the content you see me put out is our conversations, my understanding, our discussions. And then I come here and I have these interviews and I put it out with that understanding. Mm -hmm. So if I didn't, I wouldn't be able to have these conversations with you and these viewpoints, unless those people who are therapists were in my life that educated me as I built this up. Mm. So it's like right now, what you're seeing is closer to the finished product of who I've been now compared to who I was before the education, before having these sit downs, before having the hard discussions with my friends that are therapists. And like, I do understand your sentiment though, but it's just like, you know, so I'm also- Some therapists have all the answers. I do, I do believe some therapists are there to really help and that they have really worked hard on helping people and they're willing to go to the ends of the earth for some of their clients and they've tried. And I also believe that there are some really shitty therapists out there who shouldn't be therapists. <laughs> it's not fun. The dating isn't fun. It sucks when you got to go from person to person to person to person to person to person. To person to person to person. Yeah. To person to person to person until you find the right one. It's just like, you know, that's not that's not ideal, but unfortunately we don't and we never have really lived in a very ideal world. So all people like me can do is make the journey more comfortable trying to find the right therapist or find the right solution for my people until they get better. 
and just have like, I'm like a gas station with snacks and really comfortable cushions as folks are figuring things out. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? I, I don't, I would never look down on someone's journey. I do have an issue with folks giving up on themselves, obviously, but like, I do understand why people are like, hey man, I'm tired. This has been a lot. But I'm not rooting for that. You're aware of this. I'm not rooting for that. I, me having an understanding and what I'm rooting for are two separate things. And I mean, whether folks are my friends or not, it, it's fuck me. It's, it's never about the friendship. It's about, hey, you. Like, not, not all relationships are going to work out in life. But it is very nice when there are certain relationships that are dependable and the people aren't who they actually say that they are. Like, you hit me up. You, we had this day coming up for a while. We had to change a couple of times. What's one of the first questions I asked you? Hey, man, you like smoothies? <laughs> I said, hey, you like smoothies? Pull up. All right, cool. I'll make you a smoothie. We'll sit down and chat. Because it's like, shit sucks. So I'm, I don't look forward to being the suck in my friends' lives. And another thing is, going back onto the situation with therapists, mm -hmm. you never want to put yourself in a situation where you're working with a therapist that tell you that they suggest that you should do something. Mm -hmm. And if you tell them that you're not comfortable with it and you're being genuinely honest with, you, mm -hmm. honest with them and they get upset with you about that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's, that's if never... You, if you're going to be upset with that's me... That's a red flag. If you're going to be upset with me... I don't feel comfortable doing that. What's the problem with me saying that? If, you, if you're going to be upset with me as the therapist, the therapist in that situation should have the maturity to explain their feelings as to why they're upset with you instead of getting hype. Because as a client, you're already raw. You're already feeling all the emotions in the session, right? And I mean, are therapists human? Yes. I'm not saying they shouldn't be human, that they shouldn't be void of their emotions. There's a difference between... But they shouldn't be upset if one of their clients said they're uncomfortable. You're human. You're human. Right? Well, here we out. When my sister said what she said, now remember, I'm the brother. This is my sister. I'm going to be defensive, but it's just like, nah, what the therapist should have said or what would be the better response is, I'm disappointed because we've done all these sessions and there's a correlation that I come, that we come back to in a lot of these sessions, which is the thing that I told you to approach. That's an explanation that's void of emotion, right? Then explaining, I can suggest these three things, but we've already worked on that. And this is the one thing that's left that I think would make a big impact in your life. That's someone who cares about you. That's someone who's willing to get raw with you and say, I know you're uncomfortable with this, but this is the math that I've come to in our sessions of what I've seen and heard and why not just you don't listen no that's an accusation you you're not there to accuse your client you feel what i'm saying well well you know what's the plan no now you're deflecting and you're trying to change the subject you're not dating which is crazy because i said dating therapists so many times mm -hmm. you guys aren't in a relationship with boyfriend girlfriend or girlfriend girlfriend she's paying you to not do what you're doing right now she's paying you to have an open voice and be a stranger who listens to what's going on with them and care about the situation. And when my sister said, hey, I'm not comfortable with doing that, you have to explain even though you're not comfortable with doing that, this is why I said that. What that therapist lacks is an explanation on why you want my sister to do the thing she's uncomfortable with. What that conversation was void of was the empathy on my sister's fear of why she doesn't want to touch that subject and approach whatever you suggested. You're hopscotching. You're, you're playing hopscotch. You're jumping over the person that you're trying to help. I don't. Or did you get mad at her? Yeah, I don't. I don't tell you, hey, man, go take a shower. And then when you get out the shower, you have to walk across a field of mud. That's not, that's not going to work. What's the point of them taking a shower and getting clean and figuring it out? And that, that is where I feel, and I'm very sure the therapist has dropped the ball. Not all therapists care or have to care. 
it's nice when they care, but you have a job to do. Your job is actually supposed to be about the situation. Yeah, but the I feel like tells you what's going on. Wait, my bad. What are you about to say? I feel like your sister has the power to choose whatever she wanted to do. Oh no, she did. That's why she left her ass. <laughs> That's why she was like, "All right, peace." <laughs> it ain't nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like, like the therapist was absolutely wrong. She got hired for one job, and she decided, "Nah, this is what my job is. This is what the solution is." Blah blah blah. And it's like, no, you don't look down on your clients. You think just because you have a degree, your client doesn't know? Hey, man, you tripping? You can't. You can't do that. That's not. That's not what our work is. That's not what the work of getting people help is or understanding their situations or trying to lead them the right way. That's not what this ever is. Now, now I get why you say, hey, man, you do all the therapy I need in terms of me. Now, I get that. But it's just like, you know, I, I on more days, I don't have it than I do. The days I do have it, I give it. The days I don't have it, you've seen me. I crawl under rocks, man. I'm good. Is that a rock? Oh, man, I'm not the way I'm about to crawl under that rock. I'll be under a mountain. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? But now nah, with that, there's there's a lot of things that therapists could have done better. And the reason I told my sister reporter is that therapist needs to understand that there's a lot of things she could have done better. You can't do that as a professional that's here to help people. And you just and she knows that your sister has a chronic illness. She, she knows. That. Yeah. She's the therapist. She no, You're in the sessions. It's no excuse. But this also goes back to what my sister said when she could tell this therapist has not listened on a couple occasions for some of our sessions. Do you know? Do you know how fraudulent of a therapist you have to be that your client can tell you haven't listened in certain sessions, but the client is still willing to work with you and go to your sessions to get help? Think about that. You feel what I'm saying? That's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing, is this hoe not listening to me? Yeah. But am I still going to go? Because sometimes this hoe gives me some of the greatest advice I've ever heard and I could apply it to my life and it's somewhat helpful. Unfortunately, also, yes. Er. But she out now. My sister's moved on to better and that's what matters. But I share that because like the journey to getting therapy, the journey to finding the right person, the journey to being happy, uh, there's a lot of disappointment. Unfortunately, that's all that. I mean, you you know the pain that I've gone through before the current relationship that I'm in. You feel what I'm saying? So, like, I don't tell people, <laughs> embrace the hurt. No. <laughs> Just be aware, at some point, the hurt's going to be there on the path to figuring things out. And I just hope you either have the right friends or you have the right systems where you wake up and you walk and you get some sunshine and you journal and you figure things out and mm. you write love letters to who you used to be and who you are now and holding those hands and understanding that in and of itself is probably one of the most beautiful things that I've heard in the month of August going into September. And what I was saying before, I was saying that from a place of experience mm -hmm. that I would rather you know, try to take advice and mm -hmm. build that faith from a friend in my inner circle, yeah. right? Instead of constantly trying to look for a therapist to help me. Because yeah. I did that. I hear you. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to go back down that path. I'd rather hit it up with a friend. I hear you. But it just when you when you hit it up with a friend, when your friend ran out and said, hey, man, I can't do this, that left you alone. And I'd rather you not be alone with a friend's run out. You get what I'm saying? Friendship is your your boys or your girls being honest with you and saying, hey, fam, I don't have it. And you need more than what we are. And taking that seriously. Because you deserve better. It's it's not about abandonment. That's never what this has ever has been. It's about, hey. If you go to your grocery store and they don't have your favorite cereal. And they don't have milk. What do you have to do? You got to find another grocery store. Yeah. Because I know I remember a while back, I think it was probably late last year, mm -hmm. we had a conversation about my stepbrother, Nick. Yeah. And me and him had got into it yeah. because Is that he was it didn't show up to the birthday shindig that no, we did. Yeah, you did. No, was, uh, Nick was there. Who's the other one that didn't show up? Uh, Brian. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so me and Nick had got into it because obviously I'm explaining him through experience. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, I'm telling you, to go see a psychologist, see a therapist, why are you not listening to me? And we had this conversation, and he was like, why did Nick had to say that? Why didn't Nick get upset with you? Because mm -hmm. I told Nick, 
yo, I've been down that path before. I want to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't want to get help, how can I help you? If you can't help yourself, how can I help you? Yeah. And then that's when we had a conversation. You're like, Nick tripping. <laughs> was, was it Nick was tripping or was it Brian that was Nick, tripping? And then Nick with the dreads? Yeah. With well, the long hair, right? Mm -hmm. He's like, See, well, how can I help you if you're not trying to help yourself? I'm like, for that situation, though, the reason Nick was tripping is... Just because I don't want to see a therapist don't mean I don't want to get the help. It's just that I don't want to trust a therapist and go to them again. Nick, Nick, you doesn't, Nick doesn't acknowledge the trauma that you carry with you from when you were a kid and a teenager. That surprised me. And you've had a bunch of therapists that have disappointed you and let you down. I can't, I can't tell someone that's gone through that, yo, go get therapy, go get therapy and think they're going to get therapy the next day. I, I got to stay on the ass. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? But the fear isn't any less in the room. Well, he's getting upset with me because just because I don't want to go see a therapist, I'm not yeah. trying to go out and get help. So right. that's why you're getting upset. You're, you're getting help and you're figuring things out. You just haven't gotten the therapist, then, which we all think would be a better resource for you. But we still understand what you were gone through. At no that point, before, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, you told me that. I remember we, we talked about that on the rooftop. We had a really long chat about that. I was so heated that day. I just, I remember having to take a walk to the bathroom and coming back because I was like, no, nah. I heard that saying before, right? I can't help you if you can't help yourself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You kept using that against me like I wasn't trying to seek help. Yeah, but that, that saying, that saying isn't encompassing the whole, the whole story of my struggle. You can't, you can't do that, Nick. You can't. Uh, what's 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 the person that that Nick be referencing? Cause he 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 liked to preach. What's the religion that he uh, studies? Buddhism? Not Buddhism. What he he referenced something when we were at your birthday joint, and he was doing it a lot. And I was like, I didn't know Nick was so preaching. <laughs> Christianity, that Buddhism. It it was something, but I was just like. Nick, let's just be happy to be around each other, bro. You don't you don't have to help everybody. And that's that's his that's his thing though. He likes to help everybody and make suggestions. And I, right, what's your plan? And it's like, how about we all shut the fuck up and just enjoy each other's company? That's the plan. Let's crack these jokes and have conversations about what's going on now, now what people need to be doing. Cause what you're doing is A, you're taking attention away from Zero's birthday, right? Mm -hmm. Number one. And number two, we're losing, not everybody needs purpose. The purpose today is to be here and enjoy each other's company. So let's stop trying to figure out who's doing what or not doing what. Let's just enjoy each other. And he doesn't do well at that. Great guy, don't get me wrong, but he doesn't do well at like, hey, let's just simply enjoy the friendships that we're lucky to have right now and breathe the same air as the people we care about or we're learning to care about today. And he did something similar with the situation when mm -hmm. I first was diagnosed with epilepsy. Like, yo, you need to get medication. You need to go ahead and find out all the stuff that's happening to you. I'm like, bro, this is life changing for me that this is even happening right now. Yeah, and like, give, give me a moment to take God. this in. Because like once, once you, once you, once you, I, what I know about you is, once you have that moment to figure things out, you do have a process of, OK, let's get to it. Mm. But for him, he's like, oh, let's do it right now. Now, now, no, breathe. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you going in the back of your head thinking about moments like this. And I'm like, nah, yo, it's really OK. And I mean, is that what his form of his love looks like? Sure. My mom's like that. But exactly what we just described. Like, that's how my mom is. And like it comes from a place of caring. But even with that, his crux isn't that he doesn't care. His crux is that he doesn't reel it in and care in bits and pieces of someone that cares that hard. We don't question the care, but the way you deliver the message is very important. Very. All right. Well, it's been another episode of Mental Health Monday. You know, my boy Zero. Appreciate you guys. Like subscribe share um if you guys have any questions for us please let us know this was uh giving advice to everybody on what it's like when it comes to dealing with uh unalive ideations uh the person going through it getting therapy what that struggle might look like and you know just source material on what that experience is like uh to boys juju just it's your boy juice jones from get home safe I always 
sometimes get choppy on that. But it's your boy Juice Jones from Get Home Safe. Sir, appreciate you pulling out, man. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Appreciate you. Good handshake. Good handshake.